Hello and uh, welcome back. We are in module 6. We have been discussing about the how the language processing studies, language processing experimental uh, paradigms have changed over time and um, we started with 1950s and uh, from 1950s to 70s the kind of uh, growth, the kind of different trajectories the discipline has taken we have already seen and then we also saw that by 80s things many many of the ideas were concretized and the pa paradigms were in place and how reaction time studies became more uh, and more popular with the advent of computers and availability of computers in large scale and so on. So, now let us move on to the 1990s. So, after the baseline was put in place through 50s to through uh, 70s and then through 80s, 1990s saw a very rapid growth as you can expect because now the entire paradigm has been set, the research questions have been fine tuned, the methods have been put in place, the tools are also available now. So, as a result of all of these, the 90s saw a, a quite an explosion of research in terms of lexical, um, both lexical representation as well as processing. When we talk about processing, we cannot uh, uh, avoid representation as well. So, in both of these domains, uh, in bilingual uh, language processing literature, saw a very rapid growth. So, also uh, a number of there this, is, this was also a time of um, um, uh, stock taking in some sense. So, there were lots of uh, reviews that came up during that time, um, quite uh, many of them were very important uh, and we still refer to them. So, many of the state of the art reviews uh, that highlighted the progress, the uh, various changes that have taken place in the previous decades the, that came out in during this time and also this provided in depth analysis of various issues. So, what, uh, what is the way ahead, what are the problems that, uh, that uh, stood at that type point of time uh, both in terms of theory as well as in terms of methods, task selection, stimulus uh, creation so on and so forth. So, all kinds of important issues within bilingual language processing dealing with both uh, representation and processing were, uh, were brought out. Impo most important of them are a uh, few, uh, few that I have uh, mentioned here. Uh, Groot and Kroll's one is also uh, quite well known. So, at the same time there were, all, uh, there were uh, few new journals that came out uh, during this time which uh, even today they, they are among the uh, best, uh, best uh, journals in this domain. So, one was <coughs> Bilingualism, Language and Cognition which came out in 1998 and International Journal of Bilingualism. These were very uh, two very important um, uh, developments during this time and as of as things uh, stand today bilingualism, language and cognition as well as IJB are among the top tier journals in the uh, field which regularly publishes uh, high standard research in these domains. So, this is how the dedicated journals in psycholinguistic uh, aspects of bilingualism actually started in the 90s. So, focuses primarily on psycholinguistic research in these domains. Now, on the research front this, this uh, area as I said this saw a rapid growth. So, this output now what are the areas within which the output um, ca can be quantified? One is diverse paradigms, different kinds of paradigms were adopted. The theoretical sophistication is another hallmark of this time because after we have seen a lot of uh, developments, lots of changes in terms of findings, in terms of tasks and so on. So, a lot of theoretical sophistication was also achieved by this time. Um, and as a result of all of these, lots of new phenomena um, were also unearthed. We will see th uh, them now. And once you have newer questions, newer phenomena that can that was uh, discovered, obviously there are new questions that emerged. So from very simplistic, very uh, generalized findings from the 1950s through 70s, 80s, and in nine by 90s, the uh, simple questions of cross linguistic priming became a very nuanced and very um, complex. Uh, domain which has multiple levels of dynamics across uh, uh, different types of uh, parameters or variables. For example, uh, proficiency was one variable, kind of task was one variable, the number of overlap was another variable and so on. So, we will just look at one a few of them. Um, another was of course, the when we talk about theoretical sophistication, we talk about um, the few models that came out during this time. Many of these we have already discussed in the previous segment. But uh, so we will just quickly go over them. Uh, 
So, proposals of new models uh, both in terms of representation as well as uh, language interaction during processing. Models of representation this is um, a distributed conceptual feature model as well as RHM which we have discussed before they, uh, they, they came out even uh, at this time. And uh, models of language interaction during processing uh, this is uh, bilingual interactive activation model and also there is inhibitory control model. These out of these four the three have already been discussed. So, we will not get into the details we will discuss inhibitory control model in a while. So, these are the four very important models that came out um, representing different domains. So, both uh, representation as well as um, processing. Processing in, in terms of bilingual in terms of BIA this deals primarily with comprehension whereas, IC model deals primarily with language per bilingual language production. These were the these were the primarily the models that came out at this time. Cross language priming studies were already there in place in 1990s, 1980s they had uh, started and by now there were a lot of uh, layers to that understanding that started emerging and as a result of which they had trained new trend emerged where new newer varieties were incorporated into the study. So, newer types of stimuli that were used, different kinds of word types were, were used for example, concrete versus abstract words and how they uh, what is the interaction between these two types similarly cognate versus non cognate and um, th these are the different kinds of uh, word types that were utilized for using for creating the stimuli. Similarly, the relationship between the prime and target was also manipulated at various levels one of them was translation pair, then there was uh, associative and semantic pair. We have talked about translation pair where uh, one word there are two words that will uh, appear in succession and the task would be to recognize the second word which is also called TE recognition translation equivalent recognition meaning that whether the second word is a translation of the first word that is translation. Uh, so, that is that is an example of translation pair. Similarly, there is associative and, and semantic pair. How are two words connected? When we talk about translation pair, we are talking about lexical level connection, but when we are talking about associative and semantic uh, pair, we are talking about conceptual level connection. So, are the words uh, semantically connected like um, apple and pear are connected semantically because they both belong to the same semantic uh, field of fruits that is semantic pair. Associative pairs are uh, those words that are not part of the same semantic domain, but somehow they are associated, they, are, they typically co-occur, so often they come together in an utterance or in a, in a conversation. Similarly, um, the other kinds of connections could be phonological and orthographic uh, connections. Sometimes uh, words are written similar in the similar way, sometimes they sound similar and so on. So, all these various as you can see there are um, much further much finer nuances that are now beginning to get uh, investigated in terms of bilingual uh, language processing at every a very small level the to from starting from the nature of the words to the different levels of connection between the words. Similarly, there were also comparison across tasks. So, they were not an, any more uh, sticking to only one kind of task, but the same subject and the same stimuli set were used for uh, different kinds of tasks. So, lexical decision task versus uh, semantic association task. So, that you could see one could see find out uh, where exactly is the difference and the similarity lying, but what kind of finer aspects of uh, processing that we can unearth. Similarly, participants differing on proficiency level as I mentioned earlier also. Proficiency level uh, difference has been a very important variable in bilingual language processing literature and then prime duration uh, as well as uh, the gap the, um, between the uh, stimulus and the target the, the, that gap has also been utilized. So, myriad types of variables and parameters started getting into getting incorporated into the research design. A very significant new development in this time is also that of what is called mass priming. We discussed mask and unmasked uh, kind of tasks. So, this made a grand entry around this time. Uh, one of the most well known studies is by Grote and Nass 1991, similarly that of Williams. So, these uh, the studies showed that mask condition has an effect on cross line uh, language priming in certain cases. So, now you see that um, 
because now with they have incorporated now the researchers have incorporated so many fine tuned uh, variables into it. Now we can see how at what level one condition may or may not have an effect. So, for example, masking can have an effect however, in non cognate associative priming. So, this is the semantic relation this is the relationship between the words and this is the uh, kind of um, the word pair. So, non they have to be non cognate. So, this is one important finding in the 90s as a result of which a lot of studies using masked versus unmasked paradigm started. Lots of processing based studies started using masked versus unmasked paradigm to see the where do we see the impact and where we do not see the impact of the prime on the target. So, the mask comes in between the prime and the target and to what extent the masking uh, has, a, has a role uh, to play to either to facilitate or to inhibit that, that, uh, that influence is what the studies try to find out. One important finding from these uh, the, uh, from the studies on mass priming and um, other kinds of priming studies was that the priming actually there is an asymmetry in priming. What does it mean? This means that priming effect from dominant language to the less dominant language was found it was quite common to find that difference however, uh, that influence however, the reverse was not always found. Meaning that if your prime is L1 and target is L2, chances of having an influence is very strong here as opposed to when the reverse happens. So, dominant language. However, this may not always be L1 may not always be the dominant language. So, there again you have another set of uh, you know variable there. So, often it is quite possible that your L2 becomes dominant and L1 recedes to the less dominant status that is also possible. So, the findings suggest that in both unmasked and masked condition cognate non cognate um, condition in all of these conditions the same kind of result was found that is dominant language to less dominant language there is an effect however, the reverse and in this, this was uh, checked in both unmasked and masked condition cognate and non cognate word pair. Then there were um, other kinds of factors that were uh, brought in by other group of researchers who did not find the same kind of result. So, manipulation of many factors uh, including cognate status including pri and prime target uh, relation as well as tasks. So, everything remaining same if the task is different often the results also differed. So, this is uh, these are the two kinds of findings with respect to cross language um, priming studies that happened during this time. So, a lot of work actually happened this is um, literally the tip of the iceberg, um, but the references are all there for anybody who is interested. Uh, in the 2000s the all of these were carried forward in the 2000s also uh, and um, the same kind of uh, result, same kind of studies are going on, but at a even more fine level. And uh, um, one important factor in 2000s is that a lot of work are also accompanied by uh, neuroimaging studies and other brain mapping various kinds of brain mapping studies. So, that we have data from both the behavioral experiments as well as from neuroimaging data. So, mass primings uh, as uh, studies have become quite complex now and there are many many variables uh, built into it having many layers and um, the differences of course, also have been found with respect to lexical and semantic priming. So, there are difference uh, differences that have emerged in various domains we have already seen cognate versus non cognate associative versus semantic um, and then you also have lexical versus semantic priming. Asymmetry as a result has remained a very important um, issue to be resolved and uh, work is still going on. Similarly, there is an asymmetry in switch cost as well that has been a very important uh, another very important domain to study that has seen a lot of um, uh, output during the 2000s. Switch cost asymmetry the, the idea of switch cost and then in what conditions the we do we find switch cost and are the switch cost same in both directions uh, if the if they are not what causes that and sometimes there is also an absent switch cost meaning there is no switch cost. So, what is happening there? So, these are the various uh, nuances within switch cost asymmetry similarly we also have priming asymmetry. So, these studies have been carried forward in uh, into the 2000s and the work is still going on in various of these domains. So, this was in a nutshell how the research uh, into in the bilingual language processing 
have evolved through the decades. So, starting from 50s till 1950s to 2000, we have now have a brief idea about the, the um, research agenda and within this time. Now, let us just look um, at some important findings in all of these domains discussed. Uh, we will not be able to of course, discuss all of the studies because the field is really vast, but we will uh, try and look at the most important findings in, in most of these domains, uh, let us say. So, the primary question that we started with this, uh, this module, we started with what? We started with the question that um, question of whether bilinguals both languages are represented in the same place. Are, are they kept separate? If they are um, separate, do they interact and what is the nature of that interaction and so on. So, baseline of this entire uh, thing is are the bilinguals two languages simultaneously activated and that seems to be the finding so far, but how do we know that? So, how we know that has come about from a number of studies for which typically looked at words, word pairs who have some sort of overlap, overlap as in in terms of orthography, semantics and phonology. So, cross linguistic overlap meaning two words, let us we, since we are talking about lexical processing. So, we are looking at the word level processing. So, when we have cross linguistic overlap, we mean there are two words that are from two different languages and they could be similar, they, there might be some overlap. Uh, on the basis of some feature, sometimes an individual feature, sometimes more than one feature. So, depending on what kind of feature we are looking at that could be orthographic similarity, there could be phonological similarity, there could be semantic similarity and so on. Sometimes these similarities are overt, sometimes though they are kept uh, covert, they are not really uh, brought out in the open, but the design is uh, created in such a way that we are still looking at the, um, the overlap. And looking at it by creating stimuli out of this kind manipulating this kind of uh, overlapping structures across languages, what basically we are trying to find out is how they impact bilingual link lexical processing. For example, if two words are similar in terms of orthography, do the, does it facilitate or does it inhibit processing in one of the languages. So, the one of the most uh, when uh, uh, well known and uh, kind of a sort of a landmark study by Dijkstra, 1998 investigated whether this kind of overlap facilitates processing. Because if there is um, there is an overlap that and the conceptual storage is the same, then there should be facilitation that is the idea. So, uh, another question that he was trying to find out is not only whether overlapping has a facilitation. Uh, effect or also, but also what kind of, what is the degree of facilitation, what is the relationship between the degree of overlap and the resultant facilitation. Is there, a, is there a, uh, an impact or is it, uh, if so, what kind of impact. So, that is basically what they tried to find out. So, the idea was if we find facilitation, then this would signal language non-selective access. Remember, we go back to our a language selective versus non-selective access hypothesis. There were uh, some proof on both sides of the of the um, theoretical position, and then later on we came to a revised hierarchical model, which says that at the conceptual level there is an overlap, there is a, a same storage, but at the lexical level there are differences. So this uh, takes us back to that uh, position. So if we find if the words are similar in some way, either orthographically, phonologically, semantically then there should be some amount of facilitation. And if we do find facilitation, that will take us back to non-selective hypothesis. If we do not find facilitation, that means each of the words are uh, is um, accessing the conceptual storage separately, meaning non-selective um, hypothesis will be uh, uh, proved. So, the study, uh, the study had many parts, there were many experiments. The first one uh, was with homographs. So, this was an LDT lexical decision task which we have already discussed. So, they used various at, as we just saw that different degrees of overlap was being investigated. So, in order to um, get there, so what they did were uh, they found false friends, homographs are also called false friends. So, they are they had words that overlapped on both ortho, o, o stands for orthography, P for phonology. So, 
where some words that were similar in terms of both orthography and phonology meaning they were both written in the same way and they sounded similar. Sometimes they the overlap was only on orthography, sometimes the overlap was only on phonology. So, by dividing the stimuli in this way in, into three way categorization, they could show what individual overlap in individual level as well as when the overlap was a little more in terms of degree of overlap. So, when you have overlap on both the features. So, as a result we have three like the types of words. Um, for example, this is a word that exists um, in both Dutch, this was a study on Dutch English bilinguals. So, the word spot is uh, written. So, in terms of orthography they are written like this S P O T in both Dutch and English. Similarly, they sound the same. So, it is sound the same in both English and Dutch. However, they mean different things, it means mockery in Dutch. Now, when we have only orthographic mapping is this, it is written like this. So, G L A D is uh, glad in, in, in English. However, in Dutch the pronunciation is very different, it is not like nowhere like um, uh, English. So, there is the mapping is only on the orthography, they are written the same way. And similarly, there is a uh, uh, mapping, there is overlap in terms of phonology, in terms of sound. So, the words they are written differently. So, C O U, uh, C O W versus K O U, they sound like uh, the same cow, cow, but it means uh, the is cow the animal in English, but it means cold in Dutch. So, in all of these cases uh, they are all false friends because they do not mean the same thing, they appear similar, but they are not same, they do not refer to the same object. However, there are gradient overlapping of phonological and orthographic features. Uh, so, these were the words and the task was a lexical decision task, they had to find out if the uh, given stimulus is a word or not. As a result all of these were used and there were also controlled words which were not false friends meaning these words where they had no counterpart in the other language ok. And they also had similar, they, had, they were otherwise similar to this and then they were non words. So, this was the uh, stimuli set because this was the entire task was done in English language. So, in order to not to interfere with that instructions were also given in English and uh, this is how they had to react. And so, the results were they found that when there were orthographic overlap they this showed faster processing meaning orthographic overlap had facilitation. When they had uh, overlapping in both O and P these items did not show any reaction time difference. And only phonologically similar uh, items also showed inhibition. So, basically this had a uh, quite a mixed result and overall the authors um, uh, claimed that this showed uh, a selective, a selective um, access because Phonological representation works at a very different level, we will see that much later. And the same study also had another experiment using cognates. Now, what are cognates? Cognates are words that are same across uh, both languages. So, they look similar and they mean the same thing. So, the semantic property is important here in the homograph, uh, in the interlingual homographs the um, or homophones, interlingual homograph and homophone the, or together they are called false friends. So, false friends do they are called false friends because they are not the same thing, they are different things. Cognates on the other hand are real friends in the sense that they are the same words, they are they, they refer to the same object in the real world. Now, interestingly even in this domain they had a um, gradation within the in terms of overlap. So, they had S O P, S stands for semantic. So, they had semantic, orthographic and phonologically mapped um, cognates. Similarly, there were cognates which, which overlapped only on S and O and uh, cognates which overlapped on, on S and P uh, without O. So, let us look at some examples first. SOP when they have full overlap meaning they look the same, they are written the same way, they sound the same and they mean the same thing. Words like film, tent, hotel, etc. And then they had uh, words like this. The, the here the semantic overlap is there as well as phonological because they sound the same. Will this is how they sound in both English and Dutch. However, they are not written the same way as you can see the spellings are different. The, so, orthographically they are different. Similarly, S O cognates these are all cognates. So, similarly S O cognates fruit is written like this in English, but they are pronounced differently. So, here there is a mapping on 
uh, semantics as well as on in orthography, but the pronunciation is different. So, pronunciation in English and Dutch for the word fruit are very different. So, but these are all cognates having different degrees of overlap, right. So, we have seen different degrees of overlap in uh, false friends and now we are looking at degrees of overlap in cognates. Findings here however, show a very strong facilitation in terms of cognate across the languages. Um, however, in homophonic cognates meaning this there were no effect. So, in both cases in, in terms of both uh, false friends as well as cognates the phonological mapping did not yield much of a positive result. Uh, however, in otherwise in case of cognates there was a robust facilitation effect and this uh, stands as a very important uh, uh, study in terms of cognate um, processing. Another domain that has been uh, studied within this uh, larger area of uh, lexical processing is the idea of neighborhood effect. Now, what is neighborhood effect or neighborhood size, neighborhood effect is uh, basically the number of words, uh, number of words that can be created by replacing one letter of that word. For example, the, ch the word chair has neighborhood size of 2 because you can manipulate, if you can just take out one letter from the word chair you can and may replace it with another letter you can have another a completely different word. So, if you go on manipulating like this how many words do you end up with that is the neighborhood size. So, this uh, this is one word. So, if you remove the R from there and you replace it with N you have chain in place of chair and then the you can also have replacing the vowel A you can replace with O and it becomes square. So, this is called uh, neighborhood uh, size of a word. So, this is another domain that has been uh, that has been studied. Um, Van Uyven, for example, found that word recognition depends on the neighborhood size of the word in both languages. So, not only the neighborhood size of the word in one language, but across languages in case of bilingualism of course. So, the speed with which Dutch English bilinguals recognized an English word like farm did not only depend on the number of English uh, neighborhood words, English neighbors, but also the number of Dutch neighbors it had. So, even, even in Dutch there are lots of um, neighborhood size also included Dutch in this case. So, basically the point is that the larger number of neighborhood uh, size you have that will have an impact on the processing, not only in the language in which the word was presented but also in the language which you are not currently using. In this case, it was Dutch. So, this suggests that lexical orthographic representations from one's native language are active during the word, uh, word level processing. So, basically this entire study was done on English language, Dutch English bilinguals, but the study was done in English. So, critical manipulation was the cross linguistic mapping on various aspects. So, in this case neighborhood effect neighborhood effect they also included words that had Dutch neighbors uh, as, as, as well as English neighbors and they found an impact of the number of, number of neighborhood uh, words that even that L1 had which automatically takes us to the uh, point where we can easily say that the native language is having an impact on the non-native language processing. Remember this entire study was done only in English. However, the way the, the connection is established between the English language words and the Dutch words had been found to have an impact. So, this naturally takes us to the, this, this is the, a, a proof for non-selective hypothesis. Similarly, phonological effect have also been studied, phonological priming have been studied through cognates as we have already seen cognates and homographs both, but studies in this domain are comparatively less. Some studies show that bilinguals are faster to recognize words from their second language if these words are primed by non words that sound like the that word. Basically, this is called pseudo homophones. Pseudo homophones are those homophones that are actually non word. It is very interesting study by Bresbert and his uh, group. So, what they did this was also a study on Dutch uh, uh, first language speakers. So, this was a Dutch French bilingual group. They found out that they will be faster to recognize the French word. So, if they saw uh, the non word just before which 
sounds like the French should if it is pronounced in Dutch. Okay. So, the critical thing here is that these are Dutch French bilinguals. The study was done in French how, and it was uh, preceded by non-word, so lexical decision task. So, non-word having um, non-word uh, as a prime and then they had a uh, uh, French word to process. However, that non-word which is non-word in French, but if it is pronounced in Dutch, it sounds like a word in Dutch. It sounds like the French word if pronounced in Dutch. So, basically pseudo homophones have an impact on processing the second language. The same um, stimuli you was, was also used by on, on a group of bilinguals who had the reverse languages. So, this was a French Dutch bilingual rather than Dutch French bilingual and um, they found that the influence across languages also goes in the opposite direction. So, this works both ways. So, pseudo homophones when pronounced in the L1 sounds like a word in L2 there will be facilitation which is quite an interesting found uh, finding. They fa also found that L2 pseudo homophone prime which sounds like so if pronounced in their second language that will facilitate their processing of L1. So, basically this works in both ways. Similarly, there are studies in um, word naming studies with what is called word body neighbors. There is another kind of mapping. Mm, uh, you can see there are basically what we are looking at here is cross language priming and that priming can have different levels of overlap in terms of homograph or homophone, similarly cognates, then we looked at neighborhood, uh, they are all they are all mapped right, they are all there is all, all kinds of overlapping that are being mapped here and studied. Similarly, we even looked at pseudo homophones. Now, we are taking this forward to look at word naming in word body neighbors. Now, what is word body neighbor? This, these are word body, save and wave are word body neighbors. The de definition of this is words that share their medial vowel and the final consonant. So, basically the second part of the word if they are similar except the first consonant. This is what is a word body, um, the similarity. So, uh, Jared and Kroll 2001 study showed that people were significantly slower to pronounce words in their second language when a part of that word could be pronounced in a different way in their first language. So, the study is on second language, part of that word however has a counterpart in their first language, but the pronunciation differs. Very interesting study, so they had words like bake in English. And so, this has this part, English has this part called B A I T. So, the you leave the B because we are looking at word body. So, the uh, so first vowel and the second consonant, right. So, this is the uh, definition. So, medial vowel and the final consonant. So, medial vowel is A here and the final consonant is T. So, the word body uh, needs this part. Now, this word body across language is what they were looking at. So, French English bilinguals they were looking at English word bait. However, they uh, found out that they took more time to pronounce words like bait, but not in case of words like bump, like B-U-M-P bump. And the idea and the, uh, the reason that was put forward is that, that in the, there because their first language is French and French also has a word like this and it also has, so this is you see, uh, word body neighbor. These are word body neighbors across languages. However, the problem here is that this is pronounced differently. In French, this is not pronounced like bay, this is fa. So, the pronunciation because it is different, so that had an interfering effect in pronouncing the English word. Remember, French was not used in the experiment. This is only uh, the manipulation was that these subjects were first language speaker of French, however, English was their second language and the task also was in English. They did not find similar problem with words like this which had no word body neighbor in French. So, this is um, another interesting finding with, in, with respect to uh, cross language uh, mapping overlap in various domains. However, they did not find opposite kind of impact meaning the first language was not found to be impacted. Here the impact was only from L1 to L2 and this we will find uh, in many cases there is an asymmetry. This is what is the prime um, 
cross language priming asymmetry. So, the priming in this case is not uh, always possible in the other way. So, if you have uh, French words to, pron to pronounce and they had a word body the neighbor in English language that did not affect the French pronunciation. However, English was affected because L, uh, L1 had these words. So, this is another interesting um, area. Now, till now we are looking at visual word, uh, word processing, now we will move on to auditory word processing. In case of visual word processing, what happens? The words are presented visually on a computer screen most of the time. So, you look at it and then the processing follows. So, you under you, either you comprehend or you uh, produ produce whatever. In auditory word processing, the, uh, the stimuli is presented through auditory mode. So, they uh, the same kind of logic, same kind of uh, paradigm was used here also trying to see if cross language facilitation is um, visible in case of auditory word processing as well. Subjects again were Dutch English bilinguals, this was an eye tracking study and um, this uh, they looked at a display while listening to an auditory stimuli. Let me tell you a bit about eye tracking study here. Uh, eye tra in eye tracking study what um, the paradigm used for language research is what is called visual world paradigm. Visual world paradigm is um, a paradigm where the subjects listen to uh, an auditory uh, presented stimuli while looking at a display. So, simultaneously most of the time simultaneously. So, you are listening to an input while simultaneously looking at a display. Often this display will be some pictures, there will be a grid of um, grid like this. Um, so, there is one picture here, one picture here, one here and so one, two, three, four like this. And then depending on where on the screen uh, your eyes go and fix it is what is taken as the output data. So, you as, as you listen as the auditory stimulus unfolds, your eyes will um, scan this uh, screen the display and uh, try to find a match most of the time. So, this is what is visual wall paradigm all about. So, in this particular study they were looking at a display while listening to an auditory stimuli. Now, they found that lexical competition was there in non-native spoken word recognition meaning the competition was found in case of English. English because it is the second language of these people. Uh, that is why it is non-native language and this was a recognition study. So, hearing words in English for example, desk made longer eye fixation on pictures with names in Dutch that were phonologically related to the English word. For example, what they had was as they listened to words like desk, D-E-S-K in English desk, they had various pictures on the screen. One of those pictures was that of a lid. Now, lid is uh, called deskel in, in Dutch, right. So, the word is not present, the picture of that uh, picture that would represent that word is present there. Now, when they listen to desk, the eyes will go to deskel. You see the connection, this is quite a far fetched connection. The picture is there. Now, you know the Dutch name of that picture is deskel, and the, now deskel is similar in phonologically similar to the stimulus desk in English, hence, there was a matching. So, they were looking at that picture even though this is not what they heard ok, because they start with the same sound. So, however, the opposite effect influence from English names for pictures on Dutch was not found right. So, Dutch English speakers did not look longer at picture of a desk when they heard the word desk. So, basically what this means is that the represent here even in this kind of studies, even in this eye tracking study in using visual world paradigm, the effect is seen from the dominant language to the non-native language, but not the other way around. So, the impact of L1 on L2 is stronger but rather that than that of L2 to L1. So, L1 does not get affected much by the L2 representations. So, so this suggests that interference from Phonological representations from the other language is larger when processing one second language. So, this asymmetry is uh, found in uh, large number of studies using different kind of tasks and different kinds of um, um, uh, paradigms. You will st still find this kind of an asymmetry that L2 gets affected by L1 in different kinds of scenarios. Similar kinds of findings are also 
um, reported by other researchers using the in, in this particular study this was Russian English bilinguals and uh, they were instructed in English to pick up the marker when they hear um, they were hearing this sentence and they looked at a stamp again the similar kind of thing they were listening to auditory stimuli while looking at the display of various pictures the picture of stamp got higher fixations fixation as in the participant looked for longer time the the eyes stayed there uh, on that picture for longer duration so that is fixation so they looked at the picture of a stamp when they heard the, the word pick up the marker now this word marker and this stamp what is the connection the connection is that stamp in russian is marka so you see this is a this is again the same kind of uh, long distance connection across languages even then you see that kind of an impact because the picture of the, the stamp is called marka in russian and hence this is a phonological overlap with the english word marker hence you find that uh, effect now let us move on to semantic and associative similarity you have seen uh, all kinds of similarities till now now we will move on to associative so what is associative relatedness and what is semantic relatedness let us just find out that first now associative relatedness is a description of the probability that one word will call to mind another word it often happens we, we talk, talk about um, you know uh, uh, cup and plate they are not the same thing but they they all they often come together right and then similarly the spider and web needle and thread coat and hanger these words are associatively related what we mean by associatively related is that use of one word quite often very often uh, activates the other word because they come together in, in terms of language use so even though they do not share any other feature they are not part of the same semantic category however they typically co-occur in a conversation or at least in the real life also so spiders often go along with web and so on on the other hand semantic relatedness reflects the similarity in meaning or the overlap feature overlap so uh, whale dolphin duck chicken they are semantically correlated they are same in terms of either features or in terms of meaning and so on so these are the two kinds of association that we will now look at it is possible for words to be either highly associated yet semantically dissimilar or weakly associated yet semantically similar right so you have two kinds of features you have association associatively related versus semantically related and then you mix and match you get uh, all these kinds of possibilities so words coat and rack are semantically vastly dissimilar however they are very highly associated similarly radish and beet are semantically associated because they are both root vegetables but they never they very very rarely they co-occur right so keeping this in mind uh, now let us look at semantic priming studies using semantic priming what we find is that semantic priming over semantic priming as in when there is an overlap between the stimuli and the target in terms of semantics so what the findings suggest is that lexical decisions are faster when a word is immediately preceded by a semantic associate than by an unrelated word simply put semantically related words are processed faster so if you are prime and target so if you have uh, we have seen this before also bread and butter if you, if you uh, bread and butter are associatively related but if you also have a semantically related bread and um, let's say pizza or bread or um, burger or something like this so they will be processed faster if there is already a member of that category you have already looked at so if the semant the prime target pair word pair are connected semantically then the target will be processed faster that is what majority of the findings suggest now several studies examining semantic priming across number of languages found this advantage for a related prime okay and that priming and this effect is found not only in within language condition but also across language condition so bilinguals both languages if you have uh, two words in uh, prime and target using the uh, within the same category but across language you will see the same kind of priming so semantic priming without association etc we will find robust priming associative priming without semantic without semantic overlap also we find robust um, uh, finding for like help and wanted and something like this but there are some issues uh, sometimes we find the uh, in case of associative priming we do find the 
uh, the proof of uh, um, facilitation quite often, but there are there have been issues um, uh, uh, within that domain that are typically with task task related issues and uh, if there are different tasks sometimes we do not find the result. But by and large the finding is that semantically related primes can facilitate the target and as a result we can safely say that L1 and L2 um, share the conceptual level. So, there is at the conceptual level there is only one set of uh, only, only one stock even though lexical level there can be differences. So, similar asymmetry however is visible here too. Semantic priming effects are generally larger when the primes are in L1, targets are in L2 than the other way around. Okay. So, this is another interesting thing now um, that we have found in almost all the studies that prime yes. So, lexically connected words whether at uh, uh, orthographic level, phonological level we have seen different kinds of findings, but one thing has remained almost uh, constant which is the asymmetry and that same asymmetry we find even in terms of semantic um, priming. Though the priming uh, effects are quite robust, however, there is an asymmetry uh, whether it is from L1 to L2 or L2 to L1. And uh, this is another important thing here is that uh, the SOA stimulus onset um, uh, arrival, this is basically the gap between the two. Uh, so, that also has been found to be having an impact. And in contrast, the effect has been shown to be equally large in both directions with longer SOA. So, if the SOA is different between stimulus and, um, and uh, uh, between target and, and uh, prime, then that they would, there will be different results. So, keeping the SOA short will have more impact, having a larger SOA will have less impact. One study that we carried out on Bodo Assamese bilinguals had this kind of um, this kind of a design. So, the words this was an LDT again. Uh, lexical decision task. So, these were the pairs. So, bindi forehead and then uh, this was in across language across languages like this. So, fotha kapal and uh, similarly you had uh, another kind of whether there was uh, an association or not. So, bindi and forehead go together they are associatively uh, connected, but you pumpkin and forehead are not associatively connected. So, these were the control pairs when there was no association. However, there was this and they also had non word because this was a lexical decision study. So, uh, but this was an um, uh, this study was carried out in both masked and unmasked condition. The un, in unmasked condition effect was seen only among early bilinguals not late bilinguals. Also L1 to L2 effect was seen, but not L2 to L1. So, similar kind of findings that have been reported by many other researchers were also found here. However, there was another interesting um, addition here that there was difference between the uh, early bilinguals and late bilinguals. In masked condition however, there was no effect in either direction. So, if, if we use mask between the prime and the target in case of associative priming do not find any kind of impact. Mask primings we have already discussed before. So, we have till now we are talking about normal language processing, simple, simple language day to day language processing. Now, we can take this a little uh, one step ahead and look at how figurative language is processed. Figurative language, uh, within figurative language we are looking at metaphor here. So, in metaphor literature, uh, metaphor processing literature there are two different uh, models. One is called the direct access model, the another is called indirect access model. Direct access model talks about that uh, when you process um, a metaphorical language, metaphorical word or a metaphorical expression in either any kind of whether it is an idiom or a metaphor or a simile or whatever, there are there is this um, direct access. One does not need to go via the literal interpretation. For example, it is quite common to say, I will see you. So, this is not a simple sentence of um, that the person is going to sit and watch another person, but here this uh, this is a metaphorical usage of the word see. So, this basically means you know I will some sort of a revenge or something some uh, wrongdoing has happened and so he will avenge that. This is so now when we see when we look at a sentence like this and we are uh, faced with a metaphorical expression like this, do we interpret this as First we check out whether this here the see means actually seeing looking at something 
or does it mean different anything does it mean uh, something different. So, how does this metaphorical processing works? One theory says the direct access uh, theory says that no we do not need to go via the uh, actual word seeing to understand this we, we can directly understand the metaphor as, as it is without, without any help uh, taken from the literal sentence. The other side of the theory says that the second theory says that no we need to go via the literal sentence and then see if that makes sense when it does not then we go and look at the second meaning. So, these are the two theoretical positions that have been at the backdrop of metaphorical language processing in second bilingualism also. So, the main question is how do bilinguals process their metaphors. Now, now one important factor here is again that uh, proficiency in the L2 has been found to be directly correlated with the metaphor processing, metaphor understanding and processing in L2. So, one of the studies that looked at the proficiency as a variable found that L2 learner participants uh, could interpret much better way in a much better way uh, if the proficiency was higher as opposed to lower proficiency. So, fluency was correlated with the uh, understanding. The task here was they were given metaphors and asked to provide as many interpretation as possible. This is, uh, this is expected because the uh, proficiency in L2 means proficiency in understanding non-literal usage of the language as well. So, this is one finding. In another um, uh, well known study on metaphor processing bilingual metaphor processing they had this kind of a auditory stimuli. So, they, this was sort of a conversation that the uh, people were uh, people listened to this is the story there were many stories like this. So, there was a passage which talks about in this particular case there is a talking about a boxing bout. So, they went for a Saturday night fights and there was this guy who always lost the one boxer who he hated because this boxer was a um, rather an incompetent person and he never won he always lost and so on. And then in between he goes to get snacks and comes back and then and the show has been cancelled. Now, here is the crux what happened he asks the friend replied the cream puff did not even show up. So, what they created was the manipulation here was there was this story which ended in three different ways. One way was the cream puff did not even show up in another version of the story the fighter did not show up and in an yet another version the referee did not show up. So, in the first case the cream puff did not show up this is taken a metaphorical un, uh, look at the whole scenario. The cream puff here referring to the boxer who always lost right. The fighter did not even show up is a simple literal way of looking at it and referee when you use referee this is a control condition this is a baseline condition which does not uh, is not what they were looking at. Now, after that they were so the instruction was to listen to the sentences uh, through headphones and then name a string of letters appearing in the middle of the screen. So, after they have listened to the story a word appears and they had to read it aloud. Now, there were various words pastry, boxer and so on. Now, you see the manipulation was here when so the connection between cream puff the, the sentence the way the sentence was presented the cream puff did not show up and then presenting pastry after that and presenting boxer after that right. And the, so, do you so if you have listened to cream puff, do you take longer time to process uh, pastry or longer time to process boxer? If you process boxer faster, that means you have already mapped on the mapped cream puff on the boxer. That means you have understood the metaphorical under metaphorical uh, reading of the sentence. Or if you are connecting this directly to cream puff, and then you will be taking less time for pastry. This was the understanding. Another manipulation was here the uh, time that they gave. So, there were two uh, there were gradations of the time. So, uh, at 0 ms so immediately after listening to this passage they were presented with the words at uh, and then they had many uh, in between and they also had 1000 millisecond post offset. So, after the they have finished listening to the sentence and then after that 1000 millisecond passes and then the target object appears. Now, results actually differ depending on the kind of uh, time they gave that that is the SOA effect. So, bilinguals uh, showed 
evidence of the availability of non-literal interpretation when it was presented immediately after that, immediately after the sentence. So, if it is if it is presented quickly in quick succession, metaphorical representation was processed. However, if you give them more time, they process the literal one. So, in the first case, if in this case the boxer will get preference, in the second case the uh, pastry will get in uh, preference. Hence, time is a very important factor, time as in the time that you give between the stimulus and the target that we have seen before also and that holds for metaphorical processing as well. So, these are the various domains within language processing um, literature well, in terms of comprehension bilingual language processing in terms of comprehension. Now, let us move on to the production studies. So, we have uh, processing includes comprehension and production as we have already seen. Now, when you talk about production there are uh, various models that we have already seen the models of comprehension before and um, representation and comprehension. Now, we will move on to some models within production study. One of the uh, one of the most influential model is inhibitory control model or IC model proposed by David Green. Now, this model is concerned with language control when bilingual language production happens. Why do we even need a control? Because let us uh, go back a little bit uh, to the introduction to this uh, particular segment where we saw where we discussed that when a bilingual speaks or they understand we do not see any amount of you know time lapse when they speak go back go back and forth between languages. Even if you are a bilingual and there are sometimes code switching and code mixing, there is no time time lapse happening, which means that the second language is second language as in the language that is not currently in use is always active to be utilized that is one. Now, that begs another question if the other language is equally active all the time, we have also seen the idea of language mode in the introduction. So, that means that both languages of a bilingual are simultaneously active that means if you are sticking to one language while producing that mean that means you are inhibiting the other language. So, right now if I am speaking only in English, but my other languages are also active that means that I am suppressing those languages uh, from interfering into my English language production. This is why we need a model. So, what causes what what helps us of course, there is a uh, there is an amount of inhibition in been built into the system of a bilingual how does that work? This is the exact question that this model tries to answer. So, what kind of language control process does a bilingual uh, put in place while they produce language when they speak so to say. So, this basically this model deals with the mechanism involved in deciding which language to use while uh, doing a specific task right as I said right now. So, right now I know I have to speak only in English. So, I do not allow my other languages to uh, interfere. Now, this model has uh, is based on uh, a control system which has many uh, components and he calls them conceptualizer, supervisory attentional system, language task schema and lang lexical semantic system. This is how the model basically looks at the root of it there is a conceptualizer and then this in turn in is interrelated with the uh, attentional mechanism and then there is language task schema, uh, schema and then finally, this comes to lexico semantic system and thereby you have an output. Now, it this all these things are connected to the goal. So, right now my goal is to con, uh, speak only in English language, hence I have to choose first the conceptualizer, then go through this entire process and finally, uh, come here choose my language uh, the words lexical entities and then give an output only in English language. So, let us look at them sp um, step by step conceptualizer specifies the intended message what is it what concept should I imbibe into the words that is the first step or before you speak right before you speak internally you have to realize what what is my goal right now what is the that goal does not only refer to what but also where you are right. So, the same topic can be discussed differently using different different types of language uh, variation register or you know jargon depending on the context and the participants in that conversation right. So, all of these are taken into account at the conceptualizer level. So, the intended message is, is picked up 
and then that which is to be communicated based on the current goal this is very important. So, if I am trying to uh, make, make this entire understanding language processing if I am talking to a friend let us say I will be using a very different jargon I will be using a very different uh, way of talking let us say. So, my conceptualization my intended message will have a very different uh, coding system. So, here my coding is based on the intended message and the current goal. Now, based on this then we have the um, our conceptual content is picked up and then SAS we have already seen the attentional system they will select the right language task this goes to the attentional mechanism as to which language schema has to be utilized. So, every language has its own structural uh, properties now we need so there is a mapping on from the concept to the language and that goes through the filtering mechanism of SAS and then language and word selection happens at the lemma level where the language tag is applied ok. So, language tag so conceptualized concepts going to the SAS picks up the words at the lexical level and then these activated lemmas then are checked with activated concepts are they matching or not and then finally the output. Now, this triggers an inhibition of all lemmas with incorrect language tags this is where the inhibition thing comes in this is where the control mechanism comes into picture and this is one of the most important factors of the IC model. So, this suggests that this model also has an inbuilt um, idea that the stronger language is more difficult to inhibit and that is exactly why we see the asymmetry. So, this model of activation inhibition and control draws our attention to the language control processes of a bilingual what appears to be effortless what appears to be instinctive what appears to be pretty normal actually has these uh, as per this model has this kind of a uh, four layer system into place. So, as a result the bilingual mind is capable of preventing interference from the non target language even though the two languages are available. Secondly the people also have control mechanism in place to to control mechanism place that is employed in changes of target language. So, right now if I have to uh, change from English to Hindi or to any other language Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam or whatever that that also needs some kind of control right now to suppress English and to bring that up. So, all of these are based on some kind of a switch which, con which is uh, called control mechanism. So, as a result this control mechanism is at work for both inhibition as well as for execution of the language task and that is exactly where the idea of switching cost comes in ok. This is a very important um, idea in terms of um, language production switching cost basically refers to the uh, processing cost in terms of um, switching between two languages. When you switch language from language A to language B uh, versus language B to language A there is a cost involved meaning there is a time difference that you take reaction time difference. So, the this is reflected in terms of greater RT when there is a switch as opposed to when you are speaking in only one language. So, to give you a simple example let us say right now I am speaking in single language only in English, but if I have to name uh, objects in two different languages Hindi and English switching between Hindi and English my uh, time taken will be much longer compared to as I am taking now. So, this is the switching cost before we get to the switching cost we let us look at some studies. So, bilingual picture naming task this is this report is taken from Hernandez for 2000 this is part of a study that where he also used fMRI. So, he, this was a Spanish English bilingual group uh, the who had English as their dominant language. So, English though it was L2 second language it was their dominant language L1 was not dominant ok. This was a picture naming study in single and mixed language block in order to check the switching cost. The main result of the study revealed that mixing cost uh, was reported in, uh, in term uh, as opposed to switch switching cost. So, mixing cost was seen in both English and Spanish. So, this is the Spanish single language block RT and this is mixed language uh, block RT similarly Spanish monolingual and Spanish uh, mixed, mixed uh, block RT. So, in both the first language and the second language picture naming took longer in case of the mixed block as opposed to the single block. So, what they did was they named the pictures in both English and Spanish 
and in both cases English was named in single language block as well as in a mixed language block. What happens in the mixed language block is in the mixed block the pictures are named in English some in English some in uh, Spanish like that uh, based on some cue. So, now how long do you take to speak in English in that block versus how long do you take to speak in English name the picture in English in the single block is the difference that is measured right. So, and they found a uh, mixing cost in that study. Yet another study they found they used they had balanced bilinguals Russian English bilinguals again a picture naming task and uh, they found them to be performing similarly meaning there was no switch cost that was reported in this study and this has been tied to the, the idea of balanced versus unbalanced bilingual. Previous study had uh, the subjects were more proficient in their L2 English was the dominant language however, this was a balanced bilingual study. Here another study by Golan and Ferreira they have they also had unbalanced bilinguals for a picture naming task again, but here the crucial manipulation was that that switch was voluntary as opposed to uh, inbuilt in the system. So, as a result the participants were free to choose when to switch or not to switch and they found that there is they did not find any uh, switch cost. So, uh, very low switch cost or absent switch cost. So, this is again was tied to being whether the switching was voluntary or involuntary. So, when the when the uh, switching is inbuilt in the design meaning you are forced to switch then you find cost, but in terms of uh, free switching uh, you uh, voluntary switching you do not find the cost. So, these are the different types of finding within with respect to picture naming. Uh, another area within uh, language production is digit naming. naming. Now, digits and pictures are heavily used because uh, of certain interesting properties pictures and digits are similar in some sense in some sense because they are they provide no cue on how to pronounce the concept this is the concept itself in some sense they refer to the uh, the the what part of it right so picture of a uh, of a tree is what is it the tree but you it doesn't give any any overt clue as to how to pronounce it so the phonology orthography all of these things are may, missing there it is only the concept only the semantics. However, there are some differences between picture naming pictures and digits. So, digit naming is considered less demanding because they have less visual complexity as opposed to pictures and um, uh, digits represent an abstract concept, uh, but pictures uh, typically will have a, a concrete concept because that is how you are uh, that is why it is possible to picture them. Second difference is that digits represent a specific semantic group uh, which is not the case for all picture sets. Picture sets can be um, you know mixed, but digits are whatever no matter what digit is it, it is still part of the same semantic group right. And a connected idea is the question of whether digit and picture naming involves the activation of semantic information. This has been, this has been uh, investigated in great detail by uh, many uh, researchers. In any case, the um, let us move on to digit um, naming experiments. So, Wang et al. in 2009 tested 15 Chinese English unbalanced bilinguals um, and their response latencies increased in both languages in the mixed paradigm. So, we are looking at switching cost. So, in terms of uh, whether it is a single language task versus it is a mixed language task, uh, picture naming showed us that typically they will have a mixing cost involved similar findings are reported for digit naming as well. So, in digit naming mixed paradigm had longer um, re reaction time as opposed to single language. Uh, again pra Golan's uh, group conducted the study on two high proficient bilingual, bilingual groups, two groups Spanish English and Mandarin English. They also found that mixed block did incur more reaction time compared to pure language or single language blocks. However, they did not find any difference between dominant and non-dominant languages. So, the switching the did not really dependent depended on the dominance factor. So, um, now we can safely say that switch cost is a, a an integral part of uh, company uh, production studies whether it is uh, picture naming or digit naming if you have a mixed uh, group typically you will have switch cost however, there are some uh, exceptions. So, Balanced by where are those exceptions? Balanced versus unbalanced bilinguals is one domain where you can find some differences. 
similarly differences will be on the voluntary versus non voluntary switch uh, conditions. Now, the next question is uh, switch cost same is the switch cost same for L1 to L2 or L2 to L1 is there are the same or um, is there uh, an asymmetry in this case also. So, this is something we will take up in the next, uh, next, next segment of this part uh, and we will also include uh, sentence processing in the uh, part 3 of module 6. Thank you. Mm -hmm.